Hallelujah. So good to see everybody. Good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? You know, years ago, we used to have a Sunday night service, and we discontinued that because one of the reasons was, you know, so that when people have me to invite me to come and minister in their churches, uh, give me time to travel. <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, I can start a, a series of meetings on Sunday night. But another reason was because so many of you drive 30 minutes, some 45 minutes or whatever, and it was just so tough. You know, we tried to get out and give you time to get home lunch, get you a little nap, get back, and it was just, it was just hard. And so we just decided, you know what, we're not going to have Sunday night service, but being we're not having Sunday night service, we're not going to get in any rush on Sunday morning. <laughs> Amen? I want the Holy Spirit to have his way. And how many of you know I'm not the Holy Spirit, and neither are you? Amen? Uh, and so we want to allow the Holy Spirit to move, just like he did this morning. I had no idea that she had something, but the Lord told me, and I actually never told her. I said, Lord, said, said, tell you, just flow. Do whatever you got in your heart. And I'd already mentioned something to Brother Milton before the service. So thank God for the Spirit of God speaking and moving. I want to dismiss the children of their classes real quickly. I know it was a wonderful services with Brother Mark. I trust that all of you were blessed. As a matter of fact, we have Brother uh, Mark's books back there in our bookstore, and we have a lot of Brother Hagen's as well, if you would like to uh, take advantage of that after or before the services. But I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad those that have joined us online. As it was mentioned earlier, I'm doing a series entitled, I Am That I Am. If you would, put up Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15. This is the text that we have been using. You know, um, I really want y'all to listen to me for a few minutes, okay? Listen closely with your heart. Because my heart's desire, as the Lord was talking to me last night, reminded me of where he brought me from. And there's a lot of people that they're in the same boat or similar boat that I was in. Maybe you wasn't raised just like I was raised. My wife, you've heard her testimony. Uh, she's raised in a Christian family. I mean, uh, you know, had nice things. I mean, uh, prosperous. And But on the other hand, for me, uh, it was totally different. It was the very opposite. Uh, my family lived in poverty. When I say poverty, I'm not talking about what a lot of people think of poverty. I'm talking about dire poverty. No indoor uh, plumbing in the house. We drew water from a well, had holes in the floor. You see the chickens under the house. Y'all get the picture. No window in the window panes where the window panes supposed to be. None of those. No glass, nothing but plastic in the winter times. And uh, my dad always drove old uh, junk automobiles. But you know what? When I got saved, I'm telling you what, folks. This word would change your life. This word would change your life. I'm always concerned when, you know, people come in and they, they begin to hear the testimonies like my wife was sharing and they hear things like Brother Milton was saying. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to be very careful of not to turn us away from what God is wanting us to have and what God is wanting us to receive. You know, tradition is one of the most dangerous things in a man or woman's life. The tradition of what you have been taught, the tradition of things you grew up in, the tradition that was passed on to you, it might have been from parents, grandparents, or others that you knew and loved. And a lot of the times, you know, people say, yeah, but, uh, you know, I grew up in this church, and I grew up in this family, and this is what we was taught, and this is what we believe. I cannot tell you the times I've been trying to talk to people, and somebody would say, yeah, but let me tell you how I believe it. But it doesn't matter how you believe it. What matters is this right here. Okay? So I don't preach my opinion. I don't preach what I believe based on what somebody said or what I saw because I learned when I first got saved, I had to admit I was as ignorant as a doorknob when it comes to the things of God. I did not grow up in church. I knew nothing about God whatsoever. And on the other hand, I had a lot of these buddies that I grew up with. Uh, my best friend, his dad was a deacon. They was in church every time the doors open. But he was just as mean as I was. He'd get just as drunk as I'd get, or, not, or even drunker. I mean, he was wild. He was crazy. Thank God, later on, and, you know, as he grew older, he finally got born again. But uh, m most of those guys that I, I grew up with, they went to church all the time. And they had these preconceived ideas, you know, about, about, about God. When I got born again, I had none. I had none whatsoever except for a few things that I would hear my dad and his brothers and the different ones talking about, we may get into it, I don't know, we'll just see how the Holy, Holy Spirit leads. But 
it affected the way I thought about God. So I had to take the Bible, and I had to do what the Bible says to do. And I, I'm just going to stop right there for right now. Let's read this Exodus uh, chapter 3. Now remember, God had called Moses. Remember, it had came into his heart when he was a young man, 40 years old, to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Remember, he had been drawn out of the water. Pharaoh's daughter had become a, a mother to him, basically. He was raised in Pharaoh's uh, the palace. And so here he is, 40 years old now, and it came into his heart. See, the Spirit of God was working in him. It came into his heart to go and visit the children of Israel. When he did, remember what he saw. He saw uh, people fighting, you know, and he tried to, uh, one day it was a Hebrew and an Egyptian. And so uh, he wound up taking, trying to take up for, for the, the guy that was being harassed. He killed the Egyptian. He had to flee for his life. Now he's 80 years old. He's on the backside of the desert. God appears to him and says, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Okay, now that's kind of in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell how God brought Moses to this place. Well, now Moses has got a question. When I go and tell the, the elders of the, of the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, now, folks, remember this. A lot of people don't realize this, but there was somewhere between three and six million people in the land of Goshen. Land of Goshen in the center, I mean, in one certain district of Egypt, there's about three to six million people there. God wants to bring them out like he had promised Abraham he would do. And so Moses has the question. When I go and tell them that you sent me to bring them out of Egypt, out of bondage, and to tell Pharaoh, let my children go, they're going to want to know what, what is your name. He said, to Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And then look at the next verse. God said to Moses, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations to this day. God is, I am that I am. One day Jesus was talking to some of the Jewish people and he made this statement. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. God has always been, I am. He is, I am that I am. And so we're going to look at some things today because I'm going to kind of take a little different direction than I was going the first two services in this series. Today's part three. But here's, Here's what I want to get across to y'all. It's time to get real. It's time to get real. This church is not a church to go to just to socialize, if that's what you want to do. This church is not a church to go and pass out business cards trying to get business. I know of people that do this kind of stuff. I've known it for years and years. This church is not a place just to go try to pick up a man or pick up a, a woman. I've watched people do that as well. Okay? And so... And y'all already know this. If you've been coming here very long, you know people don't last long here unless they're serious about the things of God. Because when I got born again, they gave me a Bible. I wore the Bible out. I still have that Bible. It fell all to pieces. I showed it to y'all not long ago. And uh, I wore it out because I wanted to know this God. This God who says, I am that I am. So I'm reading my Bible, and I'm going to this little church, you know, in South Georgia, and I'm talking to the pastor. I'm asking questions. I want to know. When I read that Jesus healed all that were sick, when I read in James chapter 5, is there any sick among you let them call the elders of the church? Why don't we just have a prayer list, and we just pray a general prayer instead of doing what the Bible says? Is there any sick among you let them call the elders of the church? Let them, the elders, that's elders that believe in healing, Amen. I know him with oil in the name of the Lord, the prayer of prayer for the saved the sick. Why don't we do that? Well, I don't know. Jesus said, these signs shall follow those that believe. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why don't we lay hands on them and pray? Well, I don't know. That's all passed away. The apostles did that. One day in heaven, everybody be, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous how religion, you know, puts everything over in the past, relegates it to the past or to the future. But you know what I found out? Religion, if you trace it back to the original Latin word, means bondage. Religion puts you in bondage. Religion will have you looking real ugly. It'll have you acting stupid. It'll have you wearing things on your head you shouldn't be wearing. It'll have you taking stuff off your face, ladies, you shouldn't. it's okay for you to wear. It'll have people pulling the jewelry off and the rings off. It'll have people wearing clothes that are dog ugly. That's what religion does. It puts you in bondage. 
But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Do you understand where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty? Somebody was talking to me recently about what somebody else was doing. And I said, listen, you do understand that I'm not the Holy Spirit. You're not the Holy Spirit. My responsibility as a pastor is to feed the flock of God, to preach and teach the Word of God. I pray for you. I plead the blood of Jesus over you. But listen to me. I'm not going to come to you unless the Lord tells me definitely to go to you about something. I'm not going to come to you about it. You're going to have to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. If you want what God has for you, then it's time to get real. It's time to get serious about it. Everybody wants a better life, right? Let's look at 1 Timothy 4 8. How many of you want a better life? A better life now. That's the motto here. A better life now. Bodily exercise profits little. Godliness is profitable into all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. He's saying, listen, you can have a better life now. The promises of God are not just for the future. They're not just for eternity or in heaven. The promises of God also are for the life that we're living right now. And let me tell you something what the Apostle Peter wrote concerning the two streams of life. He said, these great and precious promises, he said, by these, he said, you can escape the corruption in this world through lust. And then on the other hand, he said, you can partake of the divine nature. Of one life we are to, supposed to partake, of the other life we are supposed to escape. It's all up to you. If the choice is yours, God said, I lay before you life and death. I lay before you blessing and cursing. Choose life. That's an open book test right there. He gives you the answer. Choose the life of God. When the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy saying, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. He's not talking to lost sinners when he said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. He that hath the Son has life. The Bible does not say that he that has the Son will one day have life. No, it says you have life. Life in the Greek is zoe. It is the very life of God. So when Paul wrote those words, lay hold of eternal life, he was saying to you, he was saying to me, with your faith, fight the good fight of faith, the life of God that is in you, the same life that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it dwells in you. It will quicken or give life to your mortal body. That life is on the inside of you. You have to lay hold to it and with your faith release that life to flow. That life that's in you, flow into this body, flow into this mind, flow into your marriage, flow into your finances. It will affect every part of your life. But you've got to lay hold to it by faith. you got to lay hold to it. Amen? God wants you to know that you can have a better life. Let me ask you right now. Be serious. Be very honest with me. Raise your hand if you really want it. Do you want a better life? Yeah. I'm talking about better than it is right now. Yeah. You may say, Pastor, I got a good life. Do you want it even better? Yeah. Do you want it even better? I'm telling you, most people, I know most people want a better life. But here's the key. God wants it for you as well. John 10, verse 10. All of you know this, but let's look at it anyway. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. More abundantly. Now, that term, more abundantly, comes from a Greek word that means over and above, superior, excessive, superabundant. The New Living Testament says, The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and to destroy it. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God wants you to have a rich and satisfying life. How many of you know that God wanted the children of Israel to have a rich and satisfying life? When he brought them out of the, the uh, bondage of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt, he had already t told Abraham from the very beginning about this land that he was going to give to his people. He talked talk to Moses about it. Moses told the people, God has a land for us, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's an agricultural term. God wanted them to have a land. He said, in that land, you're not going to lack anything. You won't lack anything. I mean, it's a land that's just bountiful and just grows great and bountiful crops. 
when the spies went in to spy out the land, they brought back a, a clump of grapes so big they had to tie it to a, a pole and carry it with two men carried on the shoulders. One clump of grapes. Now, I love grapes, and I would love to have one of those clumps of grapes. I'm telling you right now. Can you imagine the size of them big boys? I mean, them big old grapes, you know. But what did they do? God wanted them to have a rich and a satisfying life. And the book of Hebrews tells us that they erred in their hearts. They did not know God's ways. And their unbelief shut them out. Just the same today, our unbelief can keep us outside of the blessings that God wants us to have. Understand this. The blessings of God are not automatic. The promises of God will not come to pass just because you want them to. Just because God wants them to. You see, I grew up around people talking about the Lord, but none of them didn't know what they're talking about. They really didn't. Have to, I'm just telling you like it was. They had no idea what they were talking about. They had opinions. Well, you know, so-and-so said, somebody told them, somebody told them. Oh, come on, people. That's like, like gossip. And you know as well as I do. I could whisper something in Milton's ear, and he could pass it around the room. We did it in class one time when I was just a kid. And uh, one of my Christian te my teachers was a Christian woman. She said, I want to show you all how gossip hurts people. And she started, and she whispered something in the person's ear, and every person had to pass it to the next until it got complete the other side of the room. She had the last one to stand up and say she actually wrote down what she said. It was nowhere close. <laughs> nowhere close close okay now folks listen to me. that's the way gossip is that's the way religious beliefs and opinions are they just get spread around they get twisted and distorted more and more one Sunday morning many years ago there was a lady came in sat down and uh, no, no one here knew her I don't know if she was just passing by we've had that a lot of time people going to the beach or whatever they would just stop and come in and this woman came in and she sat down and I was preaching that morning, and I made the statement, and I read the verse out of the Bible that it says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I talked along those lines of being a steward, you know, of tithing and giving and what God says about seed time and harvest along those lines. And so uh, after the service, I had walked toward the back, and the woman walked up to me and shook my hand, and she said, well, you know, preacher, she said, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. And I just, <laughs> I wanted to correct her, but bless her heart, what good would it do? She sat right here, heard me read the scripture, preach for an hour about it. Why should I even waste my time? Because I've never seen the woman again. She's never seen me again. I think she was from somewhere else anyway. But it just goes to show you that once you get something stuck in your mind, you have to on purpose get it out. You see, Jesus talked to his disciples about the, the tradition of their fathers. He said, the tradition of your fathers have robbed the word of God of its power and its effect. Thank God, Peter said, that by the blood of Jesus, not only we have been redeemed from the curse of the law, but we have been redeemed from the tradition passed down by our fathers. Thank God. Hallelujah. See, so you've got to know the truth. And Jesus said, every plant that was not planted by my father must be rooted up. He was talking about tradition. He was talking about police, uh, beliefs and opinions. Of, he said, he told those people that day, he said, you have taken the commandments of men, the doctrines of men, and you have turned it into the doctrines of God. My mama, she was a good Christian woman. As she got saved when she was a little girl, she grew up in a Christian family, always went to church. Now, they weren't taught the word that much, but they did go to church, and they did love the Lord. And so she did something she wasn't supposed to do. She married my daddy. Uh, the Bible says to be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. She was a believer. My daddy was an unbeliever. Now, thank God, after many, many years of misery, uh, he, uh, my dad did get saved before he died, about a, a year before he died. And so I know he's with the Lord. But, oh, what a price my mama paid. And my mama had all these religious traditions. Mama would tell us, now you can go over to your cousin's house. We had these two, bro uh, two brothers, uh, first cousins, Kevin and Hollis. I have a brother named Wendell. Wendell and I, Kevin and Hollis, we were all, you know, like doorsteps. 
And was Kevin, then the next year was Wendell, my brother, then me, then my other cousin. We were just like that. We were together all the time. They lived about five miles from us. We, we didn't go to church, and we, had, we worked all the time. And uh, so uh, on Sundays, we didn't go to church, and so we'd start begging. Can we go over to Kevin Hollis's? Yeah, y'all can go. we take off running five miles. We run constantly five miles. And uh, we'd get over there, you know, and there was a fish pond there. Then Mom would say, I'm telling you right now, I better not catch y'all fishing. I said, why can't we fish? She said, because you'll go to hell if you fish on Sunday. <laughs> you mean I'll go to hell if I fish on Sunday? Yeah, you'll go to hell fishing on Sunday. And you better not go hunting either. If I find out you've been fishing or hunting on Sunday, I'm going to wear you out. You know, I grew up thinking you'd go to hell if you fished or hunting on Sunday. Well, when I got saved, of course, when I got a little older, started reading the Bible, I found out. Now, the only reason you go to hell is that rejecting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? I met a man one time told me you go to hell for smoking. I was still smoking at the time. He told me you go to hell for smoking. And then I heard Brother Hagin later say, now you won't go to hell for smoking. You just smell like you've already been there, but you won't go to hell for smoking. <laughs> Amen? That's right. Smoking ain't no worse than your gossiping. Come on now. Pentecostal churches for a long time, and some of them still, they won't even allow a man to join the church, a woman to join the church to be smoked. But they'll let Sister Blabbermouth with her hair stacked on top of her head, no makeup, and, and dress dragging the floor. They'll let her not only be a member of the church, she'll get up there and sing and dance all over the church and everything, and can't wait to get out, out of church and go out there in a little circle and start gossip about everybody. Well, did you hear what the preacher said? What do you think about what the preacher said? Well, first of all, it's none of your business. Come on now. You just take the word of God, swallow it, eat it. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you right now, it may be bitter in your mouth, but it'll be sweet in your belly. That means if you'll obey the word, it'll show up in your life, and you'll be glad you did what the word of God said to do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, folks, here's the thing. I got into the Bible, and I started reading it and devoured it, and I found out the truth that God wanted me to be free. Hallelujah. He wanted me to be free. God wants you to have a rich and satisfying life. But here's the thing. I have kept hearing the Lord say last night, my people have forgotten me. My people have forgotten me. Well, that led me to look up some scriptures. How many of you know the Bible says in Psalm 91, verse 17, or 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Listen to this, Psalms 106, 21. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Folks, he's still the same God. He's still I am that I am. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and day forever. Amen? And, and here's the thing. When people forget God, when they forget who their father is, they forget who they are. As we get a little further along in this series on I am that I am, you're going to find out exactly what God thinks about you, exactly what God says about you. I want you to say this out loud. I am... Who God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 18, Moses said, Of the rock that begat you, you are unmindful and have forgotten God that formed you. Jeremiah the prophet said, A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord their God. As I read my Bible, and I would listen to the preaching, now folks, I was about 18 years old, I got saved, and I'm going to church constantly. I, I wouldn't miss. You couldn't talk me into missing church. My wife was telling Brother Mark about it the other day, one time, I was working a full-time job now, and uh, boy, I would beg people to swap uh, you know, shifts with me. I wanted, to, I wanted to be where I could go to church, I'd do anything to be in, be in church. One time, I went 21 nights in a row, 21 straight nights in a row, because this church had a week revival, this church had a week revival, and this church had a week revival. I didn't care if I knew the people or not. And some of them, I wouldn't know a, pe a person there. I'd drive two or three counties just to get there. I wanted to be in church. I still want to be in church. My wife and I got married. We went to Jekyll Island. and uh, Was it Jekyll Island or St. Simon? St. Simon. St. Simon, thank you. And... Uh, so we get down there, and it's Saturday night, 
And I get the phone book out. She said, what you doing? I said, I'm looking for a church. <laughs> Hallelujah. I found this little church of God of some kind, a little Pentecostal church of some kind down on the island. I said, we're going to church in the morning. I'll never forget it. Oh, how it blessed me. Praise God. I'm telling you what, you ought not be afraid of the Holy Ghost. I don't understand people afraid, that's afraid of the Holy Ghost. He's your comforter. He's your paraclete. He's your helper. He's your counselor. He's the one to stand beside you. He's the one to help you and teach you and to lead you and to guide you. Amen? He takes the things of Christ and reveals them unto you. He'll bring everything to your remembrance. He'll show you things to come. Why would anybody be afraid of somebody like that? Amen? Yeah, we got that little church that morning, and uh, they got to singing. And uh, have y'all ever been to a real good old-fashioned Pentecostal church? Raise your hand if you've ever been to a good old-fashioned Pentecostal church. But just because you may not agree with everything that goes on, agree with everything that's said, don't deny the Spirit, okay? My spiritual father, Ken of Hagen, said, if all you ever get is the Word, you'll dry up. All, if all you ever get is the Holy Ghost, you'll blow up. But if you get the Word and the Spirit, you'll grow up. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Just be like an old cow, he said. Spit out the sticks. Eat the hay, spit out the sticks. Amen? Amen. Don't think you know everything because you don't. I don't know everything either. Amen. I'm growing. I'm learning constantly. God is showing me things. I'm getting deeper and deeper to the things of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? There's an upward call, an upward calling of God, and I'm pressing in. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm pressing in more and more. Don't think just because I can pull out out of my thousands and thousands of pages of notes, if I wanted to, I could go to bed early on Saturday night. I could sleep all night long, you know, and get up the next morning and pull out note number so-and-so, and I could come up here and I could teach you a good old dry, dead lesson if I wanted to. But no, 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 no. I'm learning. I'm pressing. That's the reason I'm not in bed till 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock on Sunday morning. My wife knows at 8 o'clock can get me up. It doesn't make no difference what time I got in bed. It may be 4, it may be 5. Because I'm praying and I'm seeking God and I'm learning and I'm growing and I want to share it with you. You see, here's the thing, folks. As long as you are stuck where you are, you will never experience any more of the goodness and the glory and the power and the presence of God. And there's a lot of people stuck. You know why? Because they refuse to be stretched. If you refuse to be stretched, oh, I know that already. Yeah, I already know that part. Yeah, I know that. I've heard that before. Now, here's what you're doing. You're missing out because you're turning off. Listen to me. You're turning off when you need to be turning on and listening and putting demand. I can hear this to Brother Hagen right now. I can pull out some of his CDs that were transferred, you know, back in 30, 40 years ago, messages that were put on tapes and now put on CDs, and I can listen to it, and I'll be sitting there, and I'll say, Oh, my goodness. Now back that thing up. And I said, say that again. Yeah, I'm talking to him. Say that again. <laughs> and I'll be taking notes because a lot of times he'll say something and I never got it. The first 15 times that I heard it, I didn't get it. You don't get it the first time or the second time. You don't get it all the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. Amen? Amen. you got to press in for the things of God. And I don't know about you, but I love the blessing of the Lord. I just absolutely, I can't even find a word for it. Hallelujah. Whoo, there's no English word for it. How much I just love the blessings of the Lord. Amen. I was explaining to somebody just the other day that the blessing of the Lord, a lot of people think, well, you know, I got this car. I got this house. I got this job. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Well, I understand what you're saying, but let me explain to you what the blessing of the Lord really is. You know how... Y'all heard Brother uh, Mark quote it. You've heard me quote it many times. Mark, uh, Proverbs 10, 22 says, The blessing of the Lord it. Everybody say the blessing of the Lord. The now say it. Yeah. So the blessing must be a real thing. The blessing of the Lord it makes rich. And I'm not going to argue with you if you're stuck in all that crazy nonsense. You're supposed to be poor and have nothing. You're not supposed to talk about money. Jesus talked more about money than prayer he talked more about money than he did fasting or anything jesus talked more about money than anything else did y'all know that getting real quiet in this church now here's something that i discovered a long time ago when god called me to preach i discovered that the very thing that people need the most they reject because they're comfortable in this area Let's say salvation. I could be talking about salvation, you know, 
The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins, you know. The blood of Jesus has cleansed every stain, all the shame, everything's gone. We've been made righteous, and you're okay, and you're happy, and you're amening. And all of a sudden, I switched gears, and I said, the blessing of the Lord makes rich. And all of a sudden, <laughs> why did you do that? Well, you ain't supposed to talk about money in church. But somebody should have told Jesus that. <laughs> Bring me one of them plates, ushers. Bring me, where's the usher? Bring me one of them, those green plates. Let me show you what Jesus did. Huh? Let me show you what Jesus did. Talking about in church, talking about in the house of God, they got the plate sitting there. They didn't pass it around. They brought it up. Put it in. Jesus had to be standing close. He watched them while they put the money in. Oh, Mr. Big Shot Banker. Hmm, $500. Hey, lawyer. $700. Little woman, two pennies. Oh, let me tell y'all something. This woman right here, she just put more in than all the rest of you put together. You know why? Because you gave out. Come on now. You gave out of your abundance. You could have done a lot more. Did y'all hear what she said earlier? It's not about the amount. It's not about the amount. It's about the heart. It's about, it's based on what you have to give and what the Holy Spirit, that woman, she was putting a demand on something. When I got born again, because I had been so poor all my life and I started reading the Bible. Now you're talking about asking questions. Now I'm asking questions. I'm asking questions. Anybody that will listen. The problem is they wouldn't listen long because none of them had answers for me. Why don't we tithe? Nobody in that church. I don't know anybody in that church even tithe. They didn't talk about tithing. But I read in my Bible that God said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and put me to the test to see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you. Amen. More than you're able to receive it, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your... So I started tithing. Y'all hear what I said? I started tithing. I was a single man. I lived in a Cracker Jack box, little old war down trailer. My daddy called it a Cracker Jack box. Ten feet wide, 40 feet long. And it was another piece of junk. But my first public job, driving a propane gas truck, my tithe, I made $110 a week. My tithe was $11. And by the time I tithed and paid my bills, there was a lot of weeks, folks, I had no money whatsoever. Hey, I didn't even have money to eat on. You know what? God supernaturally supplied. I would find money. I would find money. You ever find money? Come on now. I learned way, way back there. My wife and I got married. She was the same way because her mom and daddy's always been tithers and givers. And uh, we hadn't been married very long. Her sister was getting married out in uh, Colorado. I had one gas card. One gas card. It was some kind of, you know, one of those things way back then that we used to use. I don't even remember what name it was, sit go or something. And uh, so we had a certain amount of cash to take with us. And I told her, I said, we're going to use this gas card you know, for all the other stuff. And so we take off. And, you know, we're driving all the way out. Kids, you know, they're little. We drive all the way out there, and we, we're, we're, I get, I don't remember how many states I got before they quit taking that car. They wouldn't take it no more. So now I'm having to spend cash. They didn't have the gas station that took it. Yeah. And uh, so now I'm having, I'm, and the restaurants wouldn't take it, and so we're having to use our cash. We go to the wedding. We get up to leave. Her mom and daddy's out there. And they say, well, we're going to go visit some friends over in New Mexico, and we'll be on, you know, be home later. So we said, okay, and we hugged everybody by, and we took off. And so we coming back through Texas, and by the time we get right in the middle of Texas, we're down to our last $20 bill. And to make matters worse, the day before, the night before, one of the kids got car sick. We had to stop. We wasn't planning on stopping, but uh, one of the kids got car sick and started throwing up. We had to Finally, we just, okay, we just stopped, get a hotel room, and now I'm spending the rest of my cash. We get up next morning, take off. Got a $20 bill. That's all I got. Let me tell you something. If you'll learn to put God first, one of my favorite verses has always been Matthew 6, yeah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. God will not let you down. He will never let you down. If you will obey God, he will never let you down. He will always make a way. It's not just a song. He is a way maker. 
God will make a way. I cannot tell you the time that God has made a way for us when the way looked impossible, when the way looked too hard. But is anything too hard for God? There's nothing too hard for God. When you learn to walk by faith, you see, when God told me to hook my TV antenna to the back of my stereo and I turned it on and listened to Kenneth Hagin, for the first time in my life, I heard somebody who knew what they were talking about. Jesus told him, go and teach my people faith. So I learned how to walk by faith, how to live by faith, by using my Bible and listening to Kenneth Hagin. And I'm telling you what, folks, you, you will never regret learning to live by faith. I refuse to worry about a thing. I am not worried about anything. I'm not worried about this new house we're building. I'm not worried about this building we're going to build right here. Brother Mark told me, for those of you that are on board with us and what we're doing, Brother Mark told me, he said, because of what you're doing and building this house, he said, it's going to lift your congregation up with you so all those that are in agreement with you. Yeah. So you better get a hold of this, I'm telling you. Yeah. Amen? Instead of running around, running your mouth, well, I can't believe Pastor building a house like that, me living in this trailer. Well, I lived in a trailer. <laughs> Excuse me. I lived in a piece of junk trailer. She didn't. I did. But when I started typing, guess what? I bought me a new trailer. Three bedroom. Three bedroom. 14 feet wide, 72 feet long. Lived in it about two or three years and sold it for more than I gave for it. Why? Because I'm tithing now. So we get in the car that next morning in Texas. She's driving. I got the seat let back. You know, it's one of those who had this little knob right here. You could let it back, and that seat would just go all the way back recline. I got it all the way back. So finally, she bumps me, and she said, Honey, we're sitting on empty. What are we going to do? We're still in Texas. We live in South Georgia. <laughs> she said, What are we going to do? I'll never forget it. I said, We're going to do what we always do. We're going to believe and trust in God. I said, Get off the next exit. So she gets off the next exit, and uh, she pulls up to the first gas station, pulls up. I got the seat let back, and here I'm hitting the button. <laughs> Boom. I open the door, put one foot on the pavement. There's her mom and daddy sitting on, uh, on the other side of the pump. Same pump that we're at. There's her mom and daddy sitting right there on the other side of that pump. They went to New Mexico. We left to come home through Texas. We didn't know the route they were taking. We didn't know when they were leaving New Mexico. We left on different days. And we, left, we left on different days in Colorado. But there they are. And guess what? Hallelujah. Thank God for my father-in-law. But thank God even more for the Holy Ghost who can make all things happen. You figure out the possibility of that happening. You bring me, you crunch the numbers and bring it to me. It could not happen again in a hundred zillion years. And so, you know, we just rode Pond Law's tail all the way home. Huh? Spent the night, ate good, bought gas. Hallelujah. Yeah, we paid him back later, but I was in a bind right at the time. No ATMs, you know, you know, we didn't have all that stuff. And so God made a way. We learned to do things God's way. Amen? So don't get offended when people start talking about money. Because let me tell you something. When I go back to Haiti and do another minister's conference, I want to bring in more than 500 ministers. Pastor Renee, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, we have been going to um, Haiti for many years now. God connected me with a man who is a, he speaks about five languages. He's a very intelligent man. He's a minister of the gospel. He pastors a large church in Haiti. He has a minister's association of about 5,000 ministers there are churches all over Haiti and other islands as well. And we sponsor the children's orphanage there. We buy every year, we buy all their Christmas presents. Every year before school starts, we buy all of their uniforms and all their school supplies. When we do the minister's conference, listen to me, we pay for them to be fed. We pay for them to have a place to stay. How many of you know it takes money? Huh? I don't even remember. It was way up there's all I know. 25,000 or more the last time we did it. But here's the thing, folks. God wants to bless us so we can be a blessing. What did he tell Abraham? He said, Abraham, I'll bless you. Y'all know what? I, now, the Lord told me I had to take this slow this morning. 
Get the picture here, okay? I'm just a, I was just a poor redneck boy, okay? When my wife and I got married, she thought, oh, dear God, what have you got on? She had to learn to teach me how to dress. If I did put a tie on, it choked me half to death, and it'd be... <laughs> I, I didn't even know how to dress, y'all. I'm surprised somebody had to tell me to get out of rain. I mean, it was a mess. <laughs> Have y'all ever heard of marrying up? I married up. The Lord promised me the best. Amen. Come on now. Amen. He promised me the best. Amen. So, growing up that way, knowing nothing about God, not growing up in church, I get saved. It's a little country Baptist church. Good people. I love them all. The ones that are still living, I love all of them to this day. Okay? Thank God for the, the opportunity that I had to get born again. And so they gave me that Bible, and I started reading it and started believing it. When God called me to preach, the head deacon came to me, and uh, one day I was out there cutting the grass. Y'all heard me tell about how I got started. I wanted to do something for the Lord. A lot of people, they get saved, they don't want to do anything. That's one of the reasons they don't grow and they don't prosper. Promotion begins at the house of God. Y'all understand that, right? Promotion begins at the house of God. I wanted to do something. So I went to them. I said, what can I do? And they were trying to think of something and can't think of anything. And finally, I said, who cuts the grass? You know, it's out, out in the country. We've got a big yard, got a cemetery. It was bigger. We had more people in the cemetery we had in Sunday morning service. Y'all get that? And some of the people in the Sunday morning service were deader than the people in the cemetery. And they didn't want any change. They really didn't want any change. What was that you were singing about the Holy Ghost this morning about change, Caitlin? Anybody remember those words about change? Something about change. Something always changes when you bless the Lord. Something always changes when you bless the Lord. Now, see, here's the thing. I don't know how many, how many of y'all grew up in a traditional type, you know, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian church? All right, most of y'all did, right? Now, you go in on Sunday morning, you know, somebody gets up and welcomes everybody and piano player, you know, she sits down, she starts playing. You've got a song leader, right? Song leader, he's standing there, you know, beside the piano, and he says, turn to your hymnals to such and such page, and we sing the first, second, and the last stanzas. It may have five or six stanzas, but we always sing the first, second, and last. I don't know where that came from, but that's what we did, right? <laughs> and so uh, I'm getting excited. I just kind of like Brother Tim. Y'all ever watch Brother Tim? Brother Tim gets excited. He'll whistle. Man, some of y'all get beside and let that rub off on you, okay? Amen. Dear Lord, amen. amen. Mine, mine and Josh, me and Josh, you know, Josh, uh, we, we have this verse that we just love, let the dead bury the dead. Yeah, let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. But if you want to live, get beside some living people. Amen. 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 Just get beside some people that's got the Holy Ghost on them, got the life of God in them. Now, you have to understand something. When I grew up, I was very shy as a kid. I didn't speak to anybody until around lunchtime. I didn't want anybody speaking to me. I'm serious. I got up. I got dressed. I went and sat down on the bench. You know, we had a bench on one side of the old table, and I didn't speak to nobody, and nobody spoke to me. I didn't eat breakfast, and I didn't eat nothing until about lunchtime, and I didn't speak to nobody until about lunchtime. And I didn't want anybody speaking to me. And that's how the reason we got so many fights early in the morning. My brother knew he, I didn't want nobody messing with me in the early morning. He started picking at me. So we fought constantly. I just over that thing. When I got, by the time I was in high school, the reason I didn't make any better grades than I did because I got so many zeros because I refused to get up in front of the class. We had one teacher. She was, I mean, she was notorious about wanting to make you get in front of the class and read, uh, do a report and read it. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not going to do it. Nope. Mm -mm. Nope. She gave me, you're going to get a zero. Give me a zero. I got a zero. I wouldn't do it. So now I get saved. Now I got the life of God in me. Don't tell me, well, I'm not made like that. You know, I see so many people shouting. I see so many people running. So many people dancing, you know, getting excited. I'm just not made that way. This isn't my personality. I mean, no, God can change your personality. God changed my personality because I got the life of God in me. And now they're singing those old dead dry songs. And I'm wondering, especially we start singing about the blood, why no one is getting excited. So I'm starting to get excited, and I want to lift my hand, and I want to save men, you know. Well, one day that deacon come to me, you know, and said, uh, we just don't have anything for you to do. I said, what about the grass? 
He said, well, we pay a man to cut the grass. I said, don't pay nobody. Pay me. I mean, don't pay me. Let me do it. Don't pay me. I'll do it myself. He said, okay. So I started cutting the grass, cemetery and everything. The whole grass season, every Saturday, that's where I'm at, okay? Then they say, well, you want to lead singing? I said, oh, yeah. Now, we, now we're talking. I want to lead singing. I love to sing. Amen? I love to lead singing. So instead of standing over beside the piano, I got my hymnal and I got out front. And I said, today we're going to sing all five stanzas. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. And old Sister Bella, you know, the one that Bella so loud, who never looked at the, at the book, she knew all of them. She had to get the book out. Because she never sang some of those stanzas, those verses that I, I'm going to sing, you know. And so I'd get them. I'd, boy, we'd, I'd stop them right in the middle of singing. I said, stop. Wait, 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 wait. You were just singing about the blood of Jesus. You were just singing about heaven. And you're sitting there and just looking like you just ate a lemon for breakfast or something, you know. And, and what's the matter with y'all? And we'd get them stirred up, you know. And the church started growing. New people started coming. Folks, you've got you to you gotta get serious about this. Do you want God's blessing? Do you want God's blessing? Amen? So we're tithing. Good things are happening. And when we begin to talk about the blessings of the tithe and the blessings of sowing your, your seed, you know, into the kingdom of God, it, it affects everything. It don't just affect your money. It doesn't just affect just your income. It affects everything. Amen? It affects how you think. It affects how you talk. It affects how you act. It affects how you see life in general. It just completely changes you into a, another person when you begin to just obey God. Amen? Amen? Folks, I cannot tell you how many times the Lord brought supernatural things into my life simply because, now here, here's the thing. I, I'm going to be doing this for two or three weeks now because he told me, he said, I want you to, to go back. And I want you to take some of these people that are learning, that are just getting started good, that are hungry, that really want to know how to get to where they need to be. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break some things down for you, okay? over these next two or three weeks. Now, I won't be here next Sunday. Holly's going to be preaching next Sunday. But let me tell you all something. I'm working that little job. I'm tithing. And there are times, you know, all I had was a dollar or two dollars or something like that to give, to give to, uh, extra things. You know, I'm sowing my seed, but that's all I got. But God's supernatural things are happening. And so one day, um, that policeman that I, I told you all about, he told me, he said, uh, one of the guys that worked for me, he said, he's going down here to this place. General Motors just opened up a, a plant down there. I said, I'm familiar with it because I worked as a, a helper, you know, bricklayer's helper when I was 17 building that place. I said, yeah, I'm familiar with it. He said, well, they're getting ready to hire. And he's going to put an application in. I just want to let you know. I said, okay. So I told the other guy, his name was Johnny. I said, can I go with you? He said, sure. So I put an application in. Didn't hear nothing. I went and put another one. Didn't hear nothing. Went and put another one. Didn't hear nothing. Well, I'm out in the gas truck one day. And I had to go through that town. I had this big, long route, you know, and uh, I had a propane gas truck completely full. I'd leave in the morning, and I'm on my different routes, you know, all over different counties, and I had to go through that very town where that place was uh, hiring. So at once I entered my tank and I'm headed back, the Lord said, go by that place now and put an application in. Brother Milton said, instruction. Did you all hear him say it a while ago? you got to follow the instruction. Well, I've already put three or four in. Instruction. Stop. Put application in. So I knew where the place was that they were taking the, the applications. So I drive my gas truck headed that direction. When I get within about three or four blocks, I can't get any further. I mean, there's just cars everywhere. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here? So I had to find somewhere in the park, my gas truck, walk three or four blocks up to get to the building. I walk in. It's packed completely full. You can't hardly get in. The place is so packed. It's just people sitting everywhere. And so I finally, get, you know, squeezed, worked my way through the crowd. I got to the front up there where there's a woman sitting at a, day, a desk. She said, can I help you? I said, ma'am, I'd like to put an application in. It was a General Motors plant, Delco Remy battery plant. I said, I'd like to put an application in. And she said, uh, I'm sorry, sir. She said, we're not taking applications today. And I said, well, well what is all this? And she said, oh, these are people that's been called. You know, they've had applications in, some of them for weeks, some of them for months. 
and they've been called in because we're starting the hiring process. We've already hired some people, but we're going to hire a lot more. And she said, but uh, they're just waiting to be interviewed. And I said, well, ma'am, I said, uh, I put in three or four applications, but I hadn't heard a thing. And I just stopped and waited. Now, most people would have turned around and walked out right then. I waited, and I waited. I look at her. She looks at me, and I just stand there. Now, it seemed like, you know, five minutes. I'm sure it wasn't that long, but I stood there. Me and her, neither one saying a word for a while. Finally, she goes, don't tell nobody I gave you this. Go sit down and fill it out and bring it back to me right now. She handed me an application. She said, I'm not supposed to do that. She said, fill it out and bring it back to me, and I'll get you an interview today. I got an interview that day. I got hired that day. I started working two weeks later, making four to five times more than what I was making. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Don't tell me it doesn't. Hey, a lot of people say, well, I can't afford. Oh, if I could tell you all the times that people had told me I can't afford to tithe. And I usually say, listen, here's the key. You really can't afford not to. Because all the problem you're having is because of your disobedience to God. Now, let, let's settle this. Does God love me any more because I tithe than, he so, than somebody who doesn't tithe? Does God love us any less or any more? No, no, none whatsoever. God loves everybody the same. Amen? A lot of people don't understand this. God is an equal opportunity God. He gives everybody the same choice. He loves us unconditionally. He loves everybody the same unconditionally. Well, let me explain it to you like this. The first church that I pastored, first church that I pastored was this, uh, it was a Baptist church there, there in Georgia where we live. And um, there was a man there that would come up as an usher. Him and another guy would come up every service, you know, and I would be standing here, and one would stand there, and one would stand right here. And so it was a habit of one of the chairman of the deacons to ask one of them to pray. So when I came in to pastor, I thought, well, I'll just kind of do what they do, you know. You know, I'll ask one of them to pray. And one of them, you know, he prayed a little sweet prayer. But this other guy, oh, my goodness. First time I called him to pray, he said, Dear Jesus, thank you for your blessings upon us. Dear Jesus, I'm asking you to bless those that give and bless those don't, that don't give. And Jesus, for Jesus' sake, amen. And I'm like, for Jesus' sake? This ain't got nothing to do for Jesus' sake. This is for our sake. <laughs> and second of all, why would you think that he's going to bless those that don't give the same he's going to bless those that does give? He would be violating his word. I said God would be violating his word. He said, when you tithe, I'll open the windows of heaven. He didn't say, when you don't tithe, I'll open the windows of heaven. Amen? He said, when you give. He didn't say, when you hoard, when you hold on to what you got. Amen? When you give, he said, men will give into your bosom, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Men will give to your bosom. I rebuke that fly in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Beelzebub, above, Lord of the fly, get out in Jesus' name. Amen. I was at the house studying the other day, and this fly kept buzzing around my head. I said, I command you to land so I can kill you in Jesus' name. He, he landed, and I went, pow. I said, I told you. That's why you got to treat the devil. Amen. That's why you got to treat the devil. Hallelujah. And I had all these good notes. I had all these good notes. I sat up for hours and hours and had all these good notes, and I hadn't even hardly got to use one of them. I haven't got to use hardly anything. How many of you want to be successful in life? Amen. But I'm going to leave y'all with this. Go to 3 John 2. 3 John verse 2. The Bible says, Beloved, I wish. Now listen to me. John is not just, you know, wishful thinking here. That word translated wish in the Greek is also translated pray. So you're not adding to or taking away if you say, I pray. That above all things. Everybody say above all things. How many of you believe that John, the one whom Jesus loved, that's what he called himself, the, the one whom Jesus loved, 
You know what John did? John had this attitude that I have, that I am my father's favorite child. He's the one he wrote about his own self who leaned his head on Jesus' breast. The one whom Jesus loved. As if he loved him more than he loved Peter. But he didn't, right? But he felt that way. I feel that way. I can't help it, y'all. Sometimes I actually feel, even though I know the truth that God loves us all the same, sometimes because of the way he blesses me, that I almost feel as if he loves me more than he does the rest of y'all. <laughs> he just blesses me so much. Spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, my family, and on and on it goes. He just goes on blessing and blessing and blessing. But see, here's the thing. I learned some secrets that I'm going to be sharing with y'all. See, if a man never says the wrong thing, everybody say never says the wrong thing. If a man never says the wrong thing, that man is a perfect man. Well, Pastor, you think you're perfect? No, I'm striving to never say the wrong thing, though. We'll leave the rest of that up to God. To be complete, to be mature, he said, oh, my goodness, folks. Y'll, will y'all forgive me if I go to another verse real quickly when we come back to this? I told you that was going to be it. But y'all going to have to say it's okay, Pastor. Amen. All right, Lord, I'm not lying. They told me it's okay. Go to James 3, verse 2, Amplified Classic. James 3, verse 2, Amplified Classic. Oh, how I love this. For we all often stumble and fall and offend in many things. If anyone does not offend in speech, never says the wrong thing, he's a fully developed character, a perfect man, able to control his whole body and con curb his entire nature. You can overcome greed. You can overcome lust. You can overcome anger. You can overcome anything if you learn to speak the word only. Never say the wrong thing. I began to make it a goal many, many years ago. And that's the reason if you come to me talking to me about what somebody did or somebody say, and if you've, already, if you've ever done this, you know what I, how I respond. I'm going to say, speak the blessing of the Lord. Love people. Bless them. Pray for them. Don't try to get even with them. Don't give them a piece of your mind. Don't tell them what you think about it. A fool utters all his words. The wise man holds it in to later. Right? Remember what the Holy Ghost told me that time? He said, determine the way you want your life to go and push your tongue in that direction. Are you doing that? How do you want your life to go? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The word power, yod, in the Hebrew means a picture of a finger pointing in a direction. Yod. Death and life is in the direction of your tongue. Death and life. Blessing and cursing. Poverty and wealth. Sickness or health. It's all in the direction that you point your tongue. That's what you're going to get. That's the reason I told you whatever you, when you say I am, remember God is I am that I am. And what did John say? As he is, so are we, so I am. As he is, so I am. As he is, so you are. As he is, so they are. That's how God sees you. Now, you might not see it that way, but that's how God sees you, right? Now, going back to this verse in 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. I want y'all to take this with you now. Really meditate on this, okay? To prosper and to be in health even as your soul prospers. Even as the Greek word there means in proportion to or in the same degree that. God says, I want you to prosper and to be in health in proportion to the prosperity of your soul, or in the same degree that your soul prospers. The Greek word there for soul is suke. It's where we get the English word psyche. Have you ever been psyched up? Huh? What does a psychiatrist focus on? Come on now. Suke, psyche, psych, psychiatrist. He focuses on mental problems, right? So God says, you're going to have to get your thinking straight now. You're going to have to get your mind thinking properly. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. When you read the Bible, my wife said it this morning, you find yourself in the Word of God. Jesus took the scroll of Isaiah, read it, 
what we call Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. He read it. The Bible says he found the place. He was looking for the place. He read it, and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He found himself in the Word of God. When I started reading the Bible, I started finding myself in the Word of God. So what did I have to do? I had to renew my mind. You want to prosper in this life? You want to live a long, healthy life? Amen? Let me tell you something. Start sowing seed in every direction you can with your prayer life, the words that you speak. Start sowing seed constantly, okay? Pray for Brother Copeland. Brother Copeland is believing to live 120 years. And if Jesus doesn't return first, to live 120 years. Healthy. Not senile. Not sick. Not diseased. Have y'all watched him preach lately? I ain't standing there preach for two solid hours. Let me see. I ha here's how I have to do it. I'm 64. Brother Jerry is 74. Brother Copeland's 84. If my mom was living, she'd be 94. And if Brother Hagen was living, he'd be 104. We're 10 years apart. Like that. Think about that. Brother Copeland, 84 years old, and can stand there and preach for two solid hours. Or more. 84. Who do you know, 84 years old, can go like he goes and preach like he preaches? But you're not going to hear him say the wrong thing. You're never going to hear Brother Copeland say the wrong thing. You never heard... Brother Hagin, I'm, I'm saying the only reason Brother Hagin went to be with the Lord. Well, there's some things I know that I can't say, but I can tell you one of the things. He said when he got satisfied, he was going. Brother Hagin got satisfied. He was satisfied, and he decided to go. But I'm going to tell you all right now, it's up to you. Paul said, I'm between a rock and a hard place. He said, it's better for me to stay here with you, right? Now, he said, it's far better to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. That's far better. Everybody knows that, right? He said, but for your sake, I'm going to hang around a little bit longer. Now, I love preaching. I'd rather preach. My goodness, I can't even tell y'all. If y'all would hang in, I'd just preach the rest of the day. I'm telling you what. Oh, Holly was telling somebody the other day. She said, you know, uh, you don't have to be worried about that. You know, you, you can call on him. He preaching. now. never has to study another. Well, that may be true, but I'm telling you what. I'm going to study, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to get the mind of the Lord. But I do. I love preaching. I'd rather preach than eat fried chicken. My gosh. Mm. And I love fried chicken, even though I don't ever eat it. I love it because it don't love me. <laughs> so make up your mind. I'm going to prosper in my soul. Now, for those of you that don't know this, listen carefully. Man is a three-part being. Jesus himself said God is a spirit, right? Right? God is, everybody say God is, God is a spirit. God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. God created man a spirit being. Paul prayed, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that we would be sanctified, which means to be set apart and made holy, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Man's soul, that word there, suke, we call, we say psyche in, in English, is talking about a man's mind. His emotions. See, here's where a lot of people are being defeated. They're being defeated here in the mind. If you can control this, you can control your life. If you can control your mind, you can control everything. Because once you control your mind, now you're controlling your words. Because your words, listen to me, are nothing more than thoughts that are born, thoughts that are spoken. Now, a lot of those thoughts need to die. A lot of those thoughts need to be aborted. They should never be given birth to by speaking. The old ancient Hebrews believed that the way that you gave birth to it, listen to anything, was it had to cross the mind, the mind had to cross the lips before it become a reality and before it could get in your heart. It's got to cross your lips. Don't let it cross your lips. Don't ever, ever say, I hate you. I can't stand you. Don't ever release words of hate or strife or envy or jealousy or greed or none of that stuff. Just speak the word only. Speak the word only. Amen? Now, you may think, well, Pastor, you don't understand my situation. It's impossible. Well, God specializes in impossibilities. There's nothing too hard for God. Somebody here right now needs to shout that out. Nothing too hard for God. Nothing, hard for God. nothing impossible with God. All things are possible to him that believes, to her that believes, 
I believe. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. Come on, somebody needs to shout it out. There's somebody right here. Let me tell you something. There's somebody in this place right now. You are facing a dire impossibility. And you're the one that's going to have to get loud. You're the one that's going to have to shout it out. You're the one that's going to have to decree it in the name of Jesus. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto, the, unto you. You've got to say it loud. God is a God of impossibility. God can do all things. Nothing's too hard for him. I may be facing something that seems too hard, but my God is big. Amen? Quit talking about how big the mountain is to God. Start talking to the mountain about how big your God is. Amen? Speak to that mountain. Speak to that mountain of debt. Speak to that mountain of financial difficulty. Speak to that, uh, that mountain of sickness or disease or, or depression or whatever it is. Talk to it. Talk to the devil. Talk to the mountain. Talk to the problem. Don't whine about it. The longer you grumble and complain, listen, the longer it's going to remain the same. No, you've got to move forward. I heard in my spirit, I'm not talking about a voice, but in my spirit, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, a lot of the people are stuck. They're stuck where they are in their marriage. They're stuck where they are physically in their health. They're stuck where they are mentally. They're stuck where they are financially. And I want to help them get unstuck. I want to help them get out of that rut. Yeah. Amen? Amen? God doesn't want you to be like those little things running on that treadmill not getting anywhere. Huh? Y'all ever seen that? Huh? The hamsters, thank you. Little hamsters on that. He's on that. Boy, he's going. And that's what you do. You're spinning your wheel. That's the reason I asked what I did the other night when I got up. I said, have you ever seen a dog chasing his tail? Why is he chasing his tail? That tail, tail already belongs to him. Why is he trying to get something that already, already is his? And a lot of you are trying to get something that's already yours, and the problem is you're not receiving it. You're not accepting it. By grace through faith, we were saved. By grace through faith, you're healed. By grace through faith. Listen to me. Faith takes Faith receives what grace has already given. The grace of God appeared bringing salvation, right? How were you saved? By grace through faith. You used your faith. You heard the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You heard of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. You believed, you received, and you were born again, right? Yeah. But faith works the same way for everything. It works the same for your healing. It works the same way with, with the, working with your marriage and your children. Amen? I know some of you get frustrated with your children. I know that. But God doesn't want you to get frustrated. God wants you to walk in love. God wants you to walk in faith. He wants you to use your authority. Amen? Next time that, 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 that little boy starts acting up, say, boy, come out of that devil. I mean, devil, come out of that boy. <laughs> now, that's what some of y'all think. Some of y'all think, boy, that... That demon's boy possessed. He's worse than the devil. Meaner than the devil. You ever heard anybody say that? My mom would tell my brother, you're meaner than the devil. And she meant well. And she'd say, if you, boy, if you don't straighten up, the devil's going to get you. And I had to sleep with that, that boy. My older brother, I had to sleep with him. He'd wake up in the middle of the night slinging his fist, fighting the devil. I'm serious. Man, he'd just be going wide. I said, what are you doing? And I, I had a dream. The devil was after me. Don't tell your children that kind of crazy stuff. Tell them God loves them. Amen. Tell them you love them. Amen. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. I, I can almost hear, I can almost hear in the spirit when Brother Mark said, talked about slinging the blood, some people thinking, that's sacrilegious, slinging the blood. Well, let me tell you all something. Moses, he would take the blood of an animal. How would you like that? You come in here next Sunday morning, and I got a big old basin full of goat blood, huh, or lamb blood. And I just take a bunch of, you know, they use the hyssop, you know. But let's just say, for example, I just took one of those things, you know, you, you ladies use to wipe things down with that feather duster, and I just dipped it in there, and I just started psh, just slinging it. That's what Moses did. He's, he's put it on the, he's sprinkled it on the people. He's sprinkled it on the book. He's sprinkled all the instruments inside the, the, the tabernacle, sprinkle the blood. Maria would with Edder, who had a great healing ministry way back in the early 20s, she would walk through the congregation. I mean, miracles would just be happening. Blind eyes opening. I mean, demons crying out and fleet, leaving people. And she'd just walk through the crowd, and she'd just take her hand, and she said, I sprinkled the blood. I sprinkled the blood. I sprinkled the blood. And miracles would happen, but she was doing it by faith. Amen? Thank God for the blood. I'm going to tell y'all something. I heard this in my spirit. I announced COVID is over. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, now, Pastor, you know, I heard about somebody last week that got it. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I'm not participating. I don't participate. I didn't participate from the very beginning, and I'm still not going to participate. You know why? Because I'm covered by the blood. The blood, the blood is on my doorpost. The blood is on my life. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, now, Pastor, I wouldn't say stuff like that. You know, you may get it. The devil will hear you. You know, you may get it. Well, he's the one I want to hear. I want him to hear it. Amen. 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 Well, you know, he'll kill you. He'd have already done it if he could. Right. He's tried. Don't get me wrong. He's tried. But Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of the devil, all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall harm you. Amen. Nothing by any means shall harm me. Amen. Jesus said, Nobody, nobody's taking my life. No man take my life from me. I'm laying it down on myself, and I'm going to take it up again. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody's talking about retiring the other day. Are y'all ready to go home? I guess I better go. We got to go on, on vacation. Is it pouring rain? Oh, we stay longer then. And uh, what was I about to tell y'all? Huh? Oh, yeah, talking about retiring. I'm, I'm like, are you kidding me? Retire? No, 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 no. I'm just going to keep refiring. I'm never planning on retiring. Y'all getting this? I am never planning on retiring. And you ain't going to see me up here, you know, 25 years from now walking around saying, everybody turn your Bible, you know. Then. No, 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 no. No. I'm telling you, the Lord is the strength of my life. He's the strength of my spirit, my soul, my body, my marriage, my family, my finances, the church, the ministry. He's the strength of everything. I give him the glory. I give God the glory. Sometimes people say, boy, you sure do talk arrogant. No, I'm just bragging on the Lord. I'm nothing without him. Without him, apart from him, I can do nothing. But guess what? I'm not apart from him. He that joins the Lord is one spirit. I'm with him. I'm one with him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Brother Charles, before we go, come here, I'm going to lay hands on you. Hallelujah. Y'all stretch your hands out toward Brother Charles. The very thing that has harassed you and come against your mind, I now take authority over it. I rebuke that spirit harassing you. I break the power of it. You go leave him now. You foul spirit in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You leave him for the glory of God right now. The glory of God is upon you and the men shall see. While the world is watching, they shall see. If only you would trust me, if only you would keep your focus on me, do not fear. Do not allow the enemy to come and tell you his lies. Cast down those thoughts and imaginations. Arrest them. Speak my word. Listen to my instruction. But you will come through on the other side, say of the Lord, and you will be glad. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. Oh, how wonderful you are, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for your many blessings. Thank you for everything you've done, Lord, in our lives. We praise you. Lord, I praise you for every person that's been saved, every person that's been filled with the Holy Ghost, every person that's been healed, every person that's been delivered and set free, that's been helped in any way. I praise you, Father God, for the blessing that's upon so many in this congregation right now because they've listened, they've obeyed, they've stepped out in faith. And I believe right now, Father God, that you're bringing increase of joy. The abundance of love is increasing more and more in our hearts. You're blessing them and increasing them in every way. And for that, we praise you, Father God. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Or maybe you're not in the congregation. Maybe you're watching online. Are you born again? Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With the heart, man believes in the righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's a matter of simply believing and confessing. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead? He bore your sins. He's alive today. Are you willing to confess him as your Lord and Savior? If you are, then pray this prayer right now. Everybody together. Lord God, thank you for loving me. Thank you 
for giving your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. I believe with all my heart he rose from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe Jesus is alive, and I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I receive him, Lord Jesus, into my life. Be my Savior, be my Lord, be my Master, and I thank you. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Isn't God good?